Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Horror Not Horror, and I am once again joined by the enigmatic Mr. Oliver Jiggins. Oliver, hello. Hello, how are you doing, Ed? I am not too bad, how are you? I'm all right, thanks. Excellent. So, uh, in this episode, we are uh, going back to a franchise we've already discussed, uh, because there are just so many wonderful examples of horror-themed episodes within it, and we are once again returning to the Hooniverse. And going back to Christopher Eccleston, uh, his his one and only series had a lot of fantastic episodes in it. And uh, last time we discussed The Unquiet Dead, which was the Charles Dickens episode. This time we're discussing a two-parter, which is The Empty Child and The Doctor Dancers, uh, which is considered to be among the best episodes of, I, of not just the reboot series, but the, among the best episodes ever uh, up there with uh, things like Blink from also the reboot series. Uh, the Empty Child, which is, I, I think, just for brevity's sake, we will, uh, just for clarity's sake, we will just refer to it as The Empty Child to refer to both parts uh, rather than The Empty Child and Doctor Dancers, uh, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, so uh, just a, a brief outline of the episode for those who haven't seen it. Uh, the Doctor and Rose are chasing some sort of canister through space and they find themselves in war-torn London. Uh, whilst they are there, they discover two things. Rose discovers Captain Jack Harkness, who is a former time agent and is attempting to sell something to other time agents, believing Rose and the Doctor are time agents. Whereas the Doctor wanders off and discovers the titular Empty Child, which is a young kid with a gas mask uh, essentially organically part of his face who wanders around asking one simple question are you my mummy uh, eventually through all of this we discover that uh, captain jack is essentially responsible for what's happened here that this empty child who is spreading his disease to other people and turning them into gas mask people uh, is a result of a alien ambulance ship crashing killing the child and trying to repair him as best as they can completely messing it up and assuming that's what the blueprint is, and going out and converting other people. Uh, and by the end of it, the Doctor finds the empty child's mother. She says he's she's the mother, and that sends out the upgrade. The end. Uh, that very, very brief and appalling um, <laughs> description does not do the episode, the story, justice. Um, this is something that I've been wanting to discuss for such a long time. Uh, it is one of the greatest 90 minutes, I think, of science fiction, of science fiction horror, of television. I think it hits so many of the right beats. Uh, it's got emotion, it's got chills, it's got fear, it's got heart, it's got comedy, it's got sexual innuendos um, with the whole Doctor Dancers thing. Uh, it's, it's wonderful from the very first minute until those end credits roll at the very end. I would, yeah, I would entirely agree with that. I'd also say it's worth pointing out uh, that obviously as a two-parter, it is probably, it is definitely one of, if not the most sustained two-parter in Doctor Who. I would actually go even further. It's The problem is this happens throughout fiction, that the second part almost always lets down what happens in usually a very good first part, whereas this, it is a consistent story. I wouldn't call it a two-part episode. I would call it a feature-length episode because it is consistent all the way through. It's mm -hmm. a movie. It, it really is. And it's so well made. And it does such a good job of introducing all of these characters. We have some wonderful little cameos in it uh, from people like uh, Richard Wilson, who plays Dr. Constantine. Uh, his little role in it is such a wonderful and huge actor that they got just to essentially do five minutes of screen time, but it was so good, and he was so good, and we'll get to it when we get to talking about that scene, but there's, there's a line that he says that just is wonderful. Uh, the entire thing is just brilliant. I just, I, and it is a great, wonderful piece of horror entertainment as well, on top of it being a great bit of Doctor Who absolutely yes um so there's let's get kind of some of the 
negative bits out of the way first because I, I think we're going to want to spend a lot of time praising this show these episodes to high heaven so let's kind of get the things out of the way that don't quite work either as a bit of entertainment or or as um as horror and the first thing that i want to get out of the way is and i guess this is because they filmed it before any of the cast and crew saw what the the uh ambulance thing was going to look like the thing they're mm-hmm. chasing and it's when they're sat around the dining table in one scene and the doctor says has anyone seen this this item it flew through space and it would have looked something like this and he kind of draws this thing and it kind of like and it kind of goes it kind of looked a little bit like that and it actually kind of didn't um he kind of just drew a very weird generic kind of cigar type shape that didn't really define anything and i guess that's because at that stage he hadn't finalized what it was going to look like um because they hadn't done the post-production and episode two hadn't been filmed by this stage obviously so i know that bit's always stood out for me and i don't know why it's just one of those little things that's always kind of niggled me a little bit i don't think i think it's a it's a bad it's a bad drawing but i don't think it's a particularly unrepresentative drawing especially when you think that at the time that he's going for bombs would have a specific shape so it would signal how dissimilar it was to the average bomb that would be falling on london um, oh, oh yeah i mean i'm being ridiculously pedantic and it's yeah no no i yeah look when, when i saw it come up i did have a sort of oh this seems really tense and then suddenly he shows us this drawing which is incredibly basic not remotely scientific yeah. for a doctor but um yeah it's one of those things yeah he and was, the other he was one, doing it quickly the other one is in the second bit which this doesn't quite make sense it doesn't quite gel with what we know about the empty child and what it can do because we're told that it's uh it can omcom it can interact with anything with a speaker grill yet there is a section that is admittedly very very atmospheric and very very good and gets horror points but it's when the the kids are in the little bunker and one of them's typing away at the at at the typewriter and then nancy's talking and she says um all right ernie uh who's typing if bill sat there because bill's just been typing and they turn to it the typewriter is typing by itself and we we've never been told in any way that that's what the empty child can do and it doesn't seem like it would be the type of thing that this space age futuristic technology would do when it, it interacts with speaker grills fine but a mechanical typewriter it just felt weird well there's a very good reason for that okay um it was a reshoot okay you see there's a line later on uh you know when uh jack harkness comes down on the bomb mm-hmm. and he's he's grabbed it and the doctor has a plan his line is uh, there's been a change of plans. We don't need the bomb anymore. Mm-hmm. And those two lines don't make any sense because you haven't heard a plan before and they've never said anything about using the German bomb. But that was because they were supposed to have a plan and it was supposed to involve using the German bomb for something. But then when they got to shooting it, they ran out of time and money, so they couldn't shoot that. So then when they got to the edit, the episode was two minutes short. And Russell T. Davis, therefore, needed to write a scene that filled those two minutes but obviously fitted in with everything that they'd shot before but didn't actually progress the story in any way and he was tearing his heart out and in, and he couldn't do it and in the end he called Stephen Moffat who I think was on holiday in Australia or something and said look look I need you need to write a two minute scene for this episode I need it by tonight and so Stephen Moffat wrote down that scene so yeah I I give it leeway because I think it is very atmospheric it works really well I love the payoff the whole who's been typing for the last couple of minutes Mm -hmm. i but yes the reason the reason you have issues with it is because it wasn't part of the original story or script i mean it it does a very good job of calling back to an earlier scene when they're in the empty child's bedroom and the tape player runs out and you're just hearing the 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 of the of the tape Uh, and and they kind of go um the tape ran out about 30 seconds ago so what's making that voice? What's what's talking? And so it is very similar to that, I guess. Uh, and so in that yeah. regard, it kind of pays off that as well. But yeah, I, it it felt very out of place, and that's good to understand why. Yeah, I, I mean, having rewatched it because the the previous time I'd watched it, I did not know that about the extra scene. 
I'm having rewatched it. I do, I do really like it because it, it fits the tone. It's a brilliant of, scene. Yeah, it's a great scene. It fits. It's really well constructed. It fits the tone of the show. Like you said, there is um, an equivalent scene earlier on, so it's more of that goodness. It, it's also a nice bit for, with Nancy and the children, and you get a bit more of how all of that works with the empty child stalking them up to that point. So, I think it is a. It, yeah, it is worth having despite the slight issue with it, and it is definitely better than the scene that we'd have had instead of the Doctor coming up with some kind of plan to blow up the thing with a bomb or whatever it was, the big budget CGI scene that it was forced to replace. I think had they gone that route, it could have ruined it. I think it, it would have been too much, actually. I think the way the scene, the way that section ends, the way the story ends, I think works really well. Um, so let's kind of take it apart uh, from the beginning because i think for me they're the only two negatives that i could bring out do you have any negatives you want to add no no really not no i don't <laughs> okay um in which case so it starts with us uh, arriving in war-torn london and i already think that this is a wonderful setting for horror because it's dark and it has a really interesting look to it uh the war era just looks so aesthetically pleasing, even though it very much isn't in any way pleasing because it's awful. But whenever we do it in television, whenever we do it in films, we always dress it so well. Uh, and it's it just always looks so gorgeous. And I think is just this idea of the blackout as well and this, this dark reality that's there because of it and the gas masks and all of this all really help to build something a little bit unsettling. Uh, but we kind of start off with a couple of jokes, um, mm -hmm. with the whole, give me some Spock. Can I have some Spock? Is there a bit of Spock too much to ask? Uh, and when the Doctor goes into the cabaret club, trying to get everyone's attention, and he starts by saying, uh, anyone notice anything fall from the sky a few days ago? And they, they all think he's a stand-up comedian. Which is, yeah, it's an amazing reveal, because it could it, so easily we could have had him open the door and do the thing that I think Matt Smith did a few times, or, you know, lick his finger and go, ah, oh, 1940, London. And no, we build up to that and we get it through a joke that, oh, why are they laughing? Why, why are they laughing to what I just said? What is, oh, okay. In the context of what is going on, what I just said was completely stupid. Yeah, I, th I think that really, really works. Uh, we then get... Uh, the doc's kind of heading off in his direction to try and find Rose uh, after he comes out of the, the club. Uh, and this is where we get his kind of the first introduction of this really unsettling world. It's a beautiful introduction because the TARDIS phone starts to ring and he's really confused by this because it's, what are you doing? Why are you ringing? You're not supposed to ring. Uh, and then just out of the shadows is Nancy, who is played by Florence Hoth. And she's, just, don't answer it. Don't answer it. Uh, it's just really creepy and unsettling. And I think it's just so unnerving. And it perfectly sets the tone. This opening sequence just perfectly sets the tone for everything that's going to unfold over the next 90 minutes. Yes. Yes. And parallel to that, we have we had Rose chasing across the rooftops, this child that's always just one a couple of floors above her at the top of the building wearing a gas mask saying mommy mm. are you my and that she's trying to get up to and you really don't know why she's trying to get to this child because this child is creepy as hell yes um <laughs> and i i like the little it's it's a silly little thing but the fact that she's wearing a union flag um mm -hmm. shirt throughout it is rather amusing uh so this kind of sets a scene and we get introduced to this other character in a moment called Captain Jack Harkness, who we're introduced to kind of as a bit of a rogue. Uh, his bisexuality is very much uh, demonstrated in the opening sequences that he's in. And when we first meet him, he's very different to the character that he becomes over the next 15 years or so of the show. But he works really well as... A character that may not stick around 
uh, as a sort of antagonist as well. It's, it's not really clear where his loyalties lie. And he's, I guess he's a spiv. Um, he's got something black market to sell and is trying to look for a, block, for a buyer. Yes. Um, yeah, you're not really sure what he's doing there or... Yeah, you're not really sure what he's doing there or what exactly when the when it becomes volcano day when all the chips fall where his allegiance is going to be and he does i guess in a way he does come out to be the he is the, by the end of it it's not just that you might have thought he was the antagonist at some point he's the closest thing that episode has to an antagonist mm. because the actual none of the other things that are actually providing the horror or any of the motivation are actually doing anything that they are aware to be wrong in any way he is the one who is actually causes all of this but not only causes all of this but causes all of this knowing that he is on the wrong side of yeah yeah and i think however it could have been played it could have been played that he is you know he, they could have punished him at the end if he hadn't have, he's, he redeems himself with a whole bomb rescue thing but uh well before then from the moment from the moment he actually meets the doctor and he sees what is going on even when he is denying that he could have had anything to do with it he is still going along and trying to well possibly just prove his innocence but there is a more proactively an effort there to help even though obviously it doesn't really come into its own until the end when he actually saves some people yeah um so let's talk actually a little bit about the uh, if we're not if we're not going to call it an antagonist or a villain i guess the this the horror element which is mm. the empty child uh, the empty child is one of the greatest creations in in uh, in fiction i think uh and it's a stephen moffat creation who also gives us the weeping angels which at some point i would imagine we will get to in this in this show uh mm. It's terrifying because I don't, if you've noticed in a lot of horror, children are used in a very spooky and unsettling way. There's something very creepy about children <laughs> in a horror setting. Uh, and it's just that, are you my mummy? Combined with the blank mask that you can't see what's behind there. And it's just terrifying like whenever this this kid is on screen and we learn by the end of it it's a really sad story as i guess we do in a lot of horror shows and horror films and tv but the empty yes, child well, is terrifying would... and Sorry, what the I empty child say... does is terrifying hmm, go on i i would so yeah i would almost disagree with you that i think in a lot of ways it really shouldn't work because in a lot of other media where we see children as horror creations, they're either paired up against other children, like in The Shining, where you don't really see the twins interact at all with uh, the Torrance parents. Um, so children tend to either be scary to other children or to adults that either have some kind of parenting figure or are supposed to be terrified of what is actually manipulating the child and the child is still some kind of symbol of innocence but there is something behind it and that's the thing that you really need to be scared of which is also the, set, the case in the shining whereas until the end with the empty child you are not aware of it of there being anything else behind this child and the child is not only the threat but it's also a physical threat you don't want it to touch you and it can punch its way through a wall if it wants to and I, so i i feel like you know, what you've actually got there is you've got this small diminutive human that you know very little about and you've got adults constantly recoiling from it. And it, it's a, it's, it is a testament to how good the writing and the performances and everything is that that works from the moment it's introduced right up until the end. And there is not a single moment where it kind of gets a bit goofy or silly or where they feel the need to introduce the idea of a much larger threat um, mm. that is personified as being behind it the child is itself the believer yeah. 
I, th- I think the the point of it not getting silly is really important because if you remember back um, a few episodes to when we were discussing uh, uh, the Unquiet Dead, one of the criticisms we had about that was the way in which the 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 villain within it was changed so much towards the end. It became it it didn't quite work out. Whereas with this, they kept consistent with with this threat throughout. And what was particularly chilling was what it did to other people. Mm-hmm. And there is this scene in the hospital where the doctor goes into the hospital and he meets Dr. Constantine, played wonderfully by Richard Wilson. And there's beds everywhere filled with people with these gas masks attached to their face. And the doctor's like, what killed them? Uh, is it the brain injury? And Constantine's response is, they're not dead. Um, they're alive. And if you get near to the child, if he touches you, you will become like that. Uh, and all through that scene, Richard Wilson is clearly unwell. And we don't quite know at the beginning why he's unwell. And then it starts to happen. Uh, he goes to say something uh Sorry, and there's even a little setup that he, several times, the Doctor tries to get close to him and he warns him off. So you get the little hint of what it will actually turn out to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says, he goes to say something, and he, he comes and breaks into the, are you my mummy? And then it's, it's a 2005 television special effects shot, so it's not 2020 movie quality, but... His face, you see him, his face becoming the gas mask. His mouth spreads wide and the gas mask ventilator just breaks through and his eyes go and just, it, you see him morphing into into the gas mask child. And it is so scary. It is genuinely an unsettlingly scary little sequence. Uh, and Richard Wilson plays the roles so well. He's got a line that he says during this section. I just, I really like uh, as a line. It's, uh, before the war started, I was a father and a grandfather. Now I'm neither, but I'm still a doctor. And I just really like that as a line. It was just mm-hmm. very much a, almost it, in keeping with that whole wartime spirit, really. But it just, it, it, it shows you the type of person he is, that he has remained here at his post uh to his own detriment and the last thing he does before he becomes something else is he tries to impart this information onto somebody else who may be able to help and it's and the- it's wonderful because at this stage you don't know where it's going um at this stage doctor who is a show its reboot is still new enough that you don't quite know what direction it's going you already know that there have been lots of deaths of characters we've met throughout the the reboot series so far so we don't know if constantine has just died um if all of these people are dead and cannot be saved uh and so the threat is genuine there it is really there uh well, sorry, now, in fact the opposite up, up to this point characters that have died in new who have stayed dead mm-hmm. so we have the opposite where if someone goes you have absolutely no reason to think they will come back no exactly and it's only kind of later in this in the show that we start to play around with the companion getting injured and whenever you do that you know they're going to be fine so there's not really that much um threat there uh even when later on the pawns get sent back in time it's, it was kind of sold as, oh, they're dead, but actually being sent back to just live your life doesn't quite feel as, as definitive an end as just killing them off. Uh, but at this stage in the run, you don't know what's going to happen, especially because these aren't regular characters. They are just characters that are bought into it for this episode or two. So you don't know what's going to happen with them. And I was, I was fairly certain throughout that we were going to lose Nancy. Um, and that wouldn't have surprised me. And at this point... Jack seemed like quite a, a likely character to go because at this stage we don't know he's going to become a regular. Um, or at least I didn't. I, I haven't read it anywhere. Uh, so you've got genuine threat there. You've got real danger. And it's all kind of shown in this last little sequence where the Doctor 
becomes the empty child himself. Um, yeah, no, just going back to the, the, the transformation that you, you said about how, yeah, the, the visual effects are a bit dated, but the, it's sold by the performance and the fact it's just in one shot and you do really get an idea of the pain mm-hmm. of having this, the ventilator just sort of coming up through the mm-hmm. throat, etc. And then, yeah, it builds up to a very good cliffhanger as well. Mm. It's uh, getting kind of onto the next section where they uh, they head up to the empty child's room. That entire sequence, again, it's just so unsettling. And they're moving around this old, now essentially abandoned hospital. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just one, um, one thing about the, the sequence with Dr. Constantine. It is a scene that imparts a lot of information, but it also adds a lot more mystery to... You get some information, but you actually get more confusing information than helpful information because you you learn about yeah that their heads are partially broken in, the chest um, has been crushed, etc. So it actually adds a lot more mystery while at the same time progressing the plot forwards, which is very done, well done together. Not only by the actor playing Doctor Constantine, but Christopher Eccleston's reactions. Yeah, it's. Uh really well staged and really well performed by all the people involved every single performer in the show in this episode uh this story is fantastic uh the the scene in the empty child's room i think is another one of those scenes that is genuinely unnerving genuinely unsettling and scary um because especially you don't realize that the threat is there until too late even though when you kind of rewatch it and you you kind of you notice when the tape starts spatting splattering uh starts slapping the difference, and the difference in the voice it's just it kind of makes it even more unsettling when you know it's there when you know the empty child is there and you know the tape is finished it makes it even more scary uh so some of the other performers in it I think Florence Hoth uh, really stood out as a very, very good character within this. She's very, very uh, quick, very, very intelligent as a character. Uh, she's like the scene where she's with in the household and the man of the house comes in and kind of sits her down and says, you know, you've been police on the oh, way, look, you've been stealing the on your brow. food on my plate. The sweat on my brow. Um and it turns out that he's been having his way with the butcher. Um, and it's just, it's so well performed by Florence Hoth. And uh, she's she's no longer acting. Um, she oh, stopped acting that's a shame. about eight years ago, to, uh, 2012, I think it was. I was kind of having a look around at what the actors and performers are up to now. And uh, she now works for a, a, a very upmarket uh, estate agency, I believe. Uh, she's left the acting scene, uh, which is a shame, but this is a role that definitely can be proud of. It's it's a really good role within a really good story. Mm-hmm. Well, it's that character is, as you talk about how how good the episodes are for re-watching and how knowing certain pieces of information actually makes scenes like the scene inside the child's bedroom more tense. And I, I think a huge part of that is the character of Nancy, because she's the only one who actually kind of knows what's going on. And so once you've had the mystery kind of explained when you're rewatching it, a huge part of the drama is kind of watching her and seeing how her performance kind of gives away uh, all of the things that you at that point don't quite know about. Mm. Uh there are some of the minor characters in it as well. Uh, there's uh, a, an officer whose name I forget, uh, but is uh, Jack's having his way with. Uh, and there's a, a smattering of smaller characters, especially with the kids. But these these main ones, Nancy and Jack and Constantine, uh, they are all wonderfully well drawn characters. And I think if we had not seen Jack again after this, he would still be quite memorable as a mm-hmm. character within that world, just because of the story he was in, because of who he was within that story. Uh, I think it 
it just it feels it's World War Two, but I feel that you could have also done this story to some degree maybe in the Victorian era of changing it up. Obviously, it wouldn't have been a gas mask child, but it's got that feel to it, that kind of older other world feel to it that you just kind of don't see. Uh, it's one of those ideas where until it's after it's happened, you almost can't believe it hasn't already been done. Yeah. But they do. Yeah. The idea of using the Blitz as the backdrop for a spooky for a spooky horror story it seems so natural and yet it was something that unlike the victorian period which is something that has been done before is is a well is a relatively new idea and yet seems like it is a classic concept yeah i i can't think of i can't think off the top of my head anyway of anything else set within the second world war with that type of spooky supernatural element and um, there are things set around that era um but yeah the the thing is as well it makes perfect sense because spiritualism became hugely popular during the second world war this was the the era of helen duncan and the uh, blitz witch trial so you've got something that is perfectly set ready for spooky horror stories and people don't seem to go back to it as much as they do with the victorian era understandably obviously but uh it's a shame because it is a a world which is ripe for spooky supernatural storytelling so uh, if anyone's got any suggestions for some great world war ii set horror please definitely do let us know in the comments mm -hmm. uh so yeah we're, we're gonna find out there's a huge huge section that is just passed us by all these years hundreds and hundreds of great stories yeah uh it'll be interesting to see what type of stories could be repurposed for a world war ii setting uh because it's, especially in theater it's not uncommon to take older written pieces set in different times and actually adapt them into a different setting like uh, shakespeare especially is frequently done in whatever past present or future setting the director wants so uh so getting back to the the story itself it's got a very strong narrative all the way through it's got a really positive resolution uh what do you feel about the story as just a piece of of storytelling um again i think it's a it's a it's a full marks thing it is kind of a mystery story because you've got all these things that are happening and you don't know why that you meet a character who seems to be linked to it but actually finding out how he's linked to it seems to deepen the mystery and then you get all of these strands that get um answered by the end and it's a story that doesn't cheat you have all the information you're told about the nanogenes you are told that nancy has a link to this child and that this child is really just chasing her you're told obviously you know that this child is looking for its mummy you get all of these all of this information and it is very well repurposed and explained at the end and then you get a surprisingly upbeat finale which still doesn't feel like a cheat mm. this is a dark story and yet when everybody lives rose just this once everybody lives it doesn't feel like oh we get the fairy tale happy ending for the kids show it feels earned and it feels mm. right and appropriate um and it didn't need to i think it could have had a darker resolution and would still have worked um but how much would that have changed our, our perception of the story because it it does get a very positive ending and it's very rare for horror stories to have a positive ending i mean if we look at again going back to the unquiet dead uh yes charles dickens survives and rose and the doctor survives but everyone else is dead and even dickens is left with the position of well he's going to be dead within a year anyway so uh whereas with this everybody lives uh would and would a downer ending how might that have altered the, the how am i that have altered it for us i don't think well we mentioned another thing we mentioned with the unquiet dead episode is how the ending not the exact ending but the scene in the cellar kind of dampens our feelings towards the episode in this case i don't think a different ending would improve it in any way i don't think i think the the empty child sticks with you after the episode is done and in exactly the same in the best way it could have and I don't think actually seeing 
more people die or just those people die or seeing the evil not actually be, def be defeated would have made it scarier. I think it, surprisingly, considering the resolution, I yeah, I, I don't think it in any way cheapens the rest of the story. What, what about you? So I, I think, yeah, I, I don't think a different ending could have destroyed it. I think it would have given us very different feelings to it. I think it would have mm -hmm. maybe, I know maybe it made it a scarier piece because it's got such a you know a threat there. Uh, I don't know. It's it's not. It's just so well done that I can't imagine them screwing it up by having a negative ending. Um, I think it would definitely have maybe. Well, I think it would have would have maybe left us feeling a little depressed. Um, but then horror films can do that. Uh, I think it would have been very risky to maybe make have it a downer ending because so many people would have died. But I think it would have still left us with a very good 90 minutes of television. I think it was just so well done that there are a few things they could do to really damage it. Um, Unless they have the empty child suddenly turn red and start screeching um, as it goes into the rift or out of the rift. Um, or worse, it turns out that this is just the Gelf again. They've come back after a century. Well, but the thing is, though, with any other... To have had a different resolution, you'd have needed an actually malevolent um, element behind it. You'd have needed the nanogenes or something to actually be working towards some kind of domination or destruction plan and i'm very very happy with them not having that with this just being a cruel twist of fate mm. and the randomness of the universe i think that does work as a horror idea the fact that sometimes horrible things happen to people who don't deserve it simply because random chance and i don't i i personally i mean i'm sure there is a way it could have been done but I think that works as a horror idea, even if without the presence of evil. Mm, no, that's fair. Um, another thing that I quite liked about this is, and this is in the wider context of Doctor Who now, is they don't bring this back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is, is, is what kind of, let the weeping angels down a bit they kept kept bringing them back and kept bringing them back and kept bringing them back whereas with this they don't and i think there's definitely angles there where they could have uh they could definitely have brought it back had they wanted to but i'm glad they didn't because i think it's left as its own thing and it works as its own thing and it's a beautiful 90 minutes of storytelling uh and there's humor in it as well uh such as the the banana plants banana trees of villingard uh and there's uh the flirting and the innuendos around the doctor uh dancing uh which i didn't pick up on until i was reading uh some thoughts on it uh, interpretation of it and it's like actually the Doctor dancing is, is essentially a metaphor for um, yeah, yeah, yes, and extended metaphor because they when they go into when they talk about Jack's future, and he talks about yeah, there's nothing to do but go out into the world and dance so many species so little time. There's it becomes yeah a clear sort of subtle way of referencing pansexuality etc it's it's probably it's probably in some ways one of the most romantic episodes at least for christopher for the ninth doctor and rose mm. uh, them dancing and the music right it, when they think that they might die and that jack may have left them and then at the end it it is the episode that sells that attraction probably at least that by that point in the series, the most. Yes, I think so. Um, there is definitely a romantic angle to their relationship. Then there's a jealousy as well. Um, the Doctor appears jealous at one point of of Jack. Uh, 
So, uh, do you have any other points to add about The Empty Child? Uh, I don't think so. What about you, Ash? Uh, no, I think we've covered it. It's an incredibly strong story, an incredibly strong episode, uh, and it's one of my favourites, and I never tire of going back and rewatching it. So, uh, let's see our scoring system then for The Empty Child. Uh, remember, you get to give each of these four points. Mm -hmm. So, the appropriateness for horror. How many points are you going to give The Empty Child for the appropriateness for horror? This this is an absolute four, not only because of the format of the, the traveling people going back in space and time, but the idea of using London in the Blitz at night is just a wonderful and perfect idea that at the very least seems original to the show so it's an absolute four out of four for me yeah, absolutely uh i'm giving it four as well because i think everything they do with it is definitely appropriate for horror they get it right it is a horror show you could have removed the character of the doctor replaced it with a different character uh and still would have worked uh, outside of the Doctor Who canon if it was taken and ran with intentionally as a horror piece, uh, as a scary supernatural television movie, I think it could have worked. Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely, I'm giving it four as well. Especially so, since, sorry, yeah, it, it almost, rather than being a science fiction story, it's almost more of a detective story. You have a mystery, you have something going on, and you have someone trying to solve what the situation is. It's, yeah completely could work in a different context yeah um so the next one is body count which uh <sighs> see it's such a good episode it feels bad having to mark it down on something but this is the criteria we're going with um what i don't know i guess it's depending on how we're discussing body count because although everybody lives rose there is a certain amount of death within it still, or at least an appearance of death. Um, there is also, I, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it two points here because not only are there deaths and yes, they're cancelled out, but there is a certain amount of gruesomeness. You have multiple references to the mangled body of a child mm. that, na that was so mangled the nanogenes didn't even really know how to fix it and what was part of the body versus what was part of the gas mask and still had the cavity in the head and the uh, ribs slightly caved in. And you also have that unbroken shot of the gas mask breaking out of Dr. Constantine's face, mm. which is, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a death, but I think that definitely counts as a gruesome, non-horror, horror-y uh, section. So I'm, I'm going to say two out of four. Okay, um, I actually agree with your reasoning. However, uh, I'm going to just give it one point. Uh, I'm just going to give it one point because although we do have sort of deaths within it, uh, it's not permanent. And I think it's, for me, I don't feel like I can give it more than one. Uh, even though, to be fair, no one has to die in a horror film for it to be um a horror film uh but body counts and deaths and afterlife and all of that is definitely part of the horror genre so uh that is something we're going to include and yeah i'm just gonna give it one so okay stays with you after finishing i mean i to be perfectly honest apart from the body count i do feel like this this two-parter is going to sweep the board in terms of points but that i when i saw that this episode as a Let's see, I'd have been about 12. I, yeah, that was a genuinely scary episode to watch. And it is one that has still stayed with me and still seems to be one of our, both of us, our favorite ones that we happily rewatch. So it has definitely stayed with me. It is one of the best Doctor Who villains, one of the scariest ones. So I'm going to go with four here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't justify giving it any less than four. Uh, it stays with me. It's an episode that you just know. And I've watched it so many times and I don't get sick of watching it. I don't get bored of watching it. I'm still creeped out and I'm still uncomfortable. And I'm still scared in appropriate measure. Uh, so yeah, I think 
definitely that gets a four from me as well. Uh, execution of the villain stroke baddie. Um, so we, we kind of discussed Jack being the antagonist, but uh, what are we including for this? Are we including Jack or the empty child itself or both or what? I, it has to be the empty child. I mean, it's the title of the first part and it is really where the creep and the threat comes in for us. Okay. What um, do you want to give it out for yourself? The only the only thing I can think of to take away from it, um, there are two minor things. One is obviously in terms of the special effects, the gas mask coming through, that's slightly dated. And then you have a couple of things like you said with a typewriter. And then you also have a point where he controls a door. Mm. Uh, he closes the door when Nancy tries to escape from the house, which seems like that's not really explained how he could have done that. Um, I, yeah, so I, it's either, a th okay, I'm going to be really harsh then. I don't know how I feel about doing this. I'll give it a three because of these minor things, which almost feels unfair to nitpick. I, th I think there are elements where it's not perfectly uh executing i think that is a justifiable reason for knocking a point off and i'm gonna do what i did last time and actually agree with you i think three uh is perfectly fair for this uh because of those little elements i think if, to give something a four it has to essentially be perfect and there are nitpicky small areas but they are areas that do detract and they are quite big within the context of what they are i mean i know there's reasons why the typewriter is there but i think it does detract from the execution a little bit because it changes what the empty child is without any explanation or, re or in story reason why so i'll also give it three uh the final one is overall scariness um within the context of a both a show for children and a science fiction show, I'd say it goes above and beyond. So obviously, if we were comparing it to some of the scariest horror films we've ever seen, that is not quite the same metric. But within the context of this series, I think it amply deserves a four out of four. Okay, so that's four out of four. Uh, I'm struggling with this one. I, I want to really, really, really want to give it a four. But... I don't, I don't know I think I think for me the happy positive ending doesn't destroy the story but I think it kind of does take away a little bit of the fear factor um you can have a positive ending and it still be scary I, I just kind of feel that it loses a little bit of fear factor in the end with the more positive ending I don't I, I really hate saying that because I think it's I think it's nitpicky and I think it is a little bit uh critical and I think I could quite rightly get ridiculed and ripped apart in the comments. Uh but I think I'm gonna have to give it a three. Uh okay. I think I'm gonna give it a three. Uh at a later date I might kick myself and go no it is a four, but I think <sighs> I, I think when you combine our two, I think seven out of eight does not seem unkind. Yeah. I disagree with your reasoning, but I think seven out of eight is in no way a horrible mark to give it. In so terms of overall that does actually bring it up to 32 out of 40. Uh, so the Unquiet Dead only got 24. Uh, so it's so far the best horror example of Doctor Who. And I think... For me, I think there's only one storyline that can beat it, and I think at some point we're going to have to uh, watch Blink uh, yes. and see whether or not Blink can beat it. Uh, so, that brings us to the end of an current edition of Horror Not Horror. Oliver, thank you. Thank you.